get him out here so you can spend as much time as possible hearing from your Ron Brook. The uh, kind introduction and for all of you guys for showing up and being here. Um, you know, Steamboat is one of the few places that have the courage to keep inviting me back. Uh, so, you know, one of the great mysteries that all of us face, and I think that everybody in the world faces, but particularly people like me who are advocates of capitalism, and many of you who are believers in capitalism, one of the great mysteries is why we're losing. Because we're losing. We're losing. You know, we're losing. Socialism today is more popular among American young people than ever before. Social democracy, social democracy, uh, which is just a code word for socialism, uh, couched in friendly terms, is gaining popularity uh, across college campuses and really across the American people. But, and I know this won't be too popular, even on the right, we don't know what capitalism is or how to defend it anymore. I'm sorry, but tariffs are not capitalism. I'm sorry, but limiting immigration, legal immigration, is not capitalism. The government decided which kind of workers industry needs and which they don't, and how many they need is not capitalism. It's not freedom. Freedom means, capitalism means, government staying out of our lives. Freedom means not telling me what to buy, at what price to buy it, from what country I should buy it, but leaving me free to make my own decision about what to buy, where to buy it from, and at what price to buy it. My decision, not Washington's decision, not any bureaucrat's decision, not any president's decision, my decision. That's what this country is founded on. Individuals, individualism, individuals standing and pursuing their own values. We've lost the sense of what capitalism really is about. There's no accident that this is the first really capitalist country in history. Because America was founded on very specific, clear principles. It was founded on moral principles. It was founded on the principle of individualism. The Declaration of Independence does not declare, does not declare your responsibility to take care of your brother. It does not declare that we have a responsibility to our community and certainly not that we have a responsibility to our state, to our nation, to our country. It declares that you have an inalienable right, an inalienable right. Nobody can take it away from you, right? That's what inalienable means. To do what? To your life, to live your life as you see fit, to follow the values that you believe will lead to your success, to your prosperity, and that the government's job is to do what? To protect you to protect you from people would stop you from that pursuit. You have a right to liberty. You have a right to think for yourself. You have a right to follow those thoughts, to act, to speak, to write, to debate as you see fit, and to make choices for yourself, not anybody telling you and commanding you on how to act. And finally, it says that you have a right to pursue your own happiness. And they establish a political system that basically protects those rights, and that's it. Unfortunately, Thomas Jefferson crossed out an important right, which would be serving us well today if it stayed in the Declaration of Independence, and that is, appears in the, in the Constitution of Virginia, and that is the right to property. That would have completed that nicely. Life, liberty, property, and pursuit of happiness would have been a slight improvement on the Declaration, but who are any of us to critique the, geniuses, the genius of our founders? Property. It's your property. You get to decide what to do with it. You get to decide what to do with it. It means, by the way, you get to decide who to employ. You get to decide how much to pay them. You get to decide when to fire them. Tell that to California. 
and you also get to decide where you're going to put your plant. And if it makes sense for you to put your plant in Mexico, it's none of the government's business. We might want to ask ourselves why American businesses are moving to Mexico and maybe fix our regulatory environment and the cost of labor in this country and all the massive regulations that make it impossible to do business in America. But the government doesn't tell me what to do with my property. That's not capitalism. That's not America. It is that idea of defending individual rights, of leaving individuals free to pursue their happiness, to pursue their life, that made America a capitalist economy, that made America the first capitalist country in the world. Because what is capitalism? Capitalism is the social, economic system where individuals are left free to pursue their life, liberty, and happiness. It is the political system in which the government protects rights, primarily property rights, but otherwise leaves us free, leaves us alone. That's what capitalism is. And the amazing thing, and this is why it troubles me so much that we're losing, the amazing thing is every way it is tried, and to the extent that it is tried, it is a massive success. What was the percentage of the world population that was poor? And I mean poor. I mean $2 a day poor. I mean poor like nobody in the United States of America is poor. What percentage of the world population was $2 a day or less of income poor 300 years ago? 95. 95 is a good number. Nobody knows exactly, but it's in the high 90 percentage. 95 percent. Indeed, since the beginning of time, since the beginning of human beings trading and what percentage of the human population has been below $2 a day of income, equivalent of 95%. And it goes up a little bit sometimes, like under Rome, things are improving, and then it declines during the Dark Ages, and then improves a little bit in the Renaissance. But generally, income has been flat for 10,000 years at $2 or less a day. And then what happens? Something miraculous happens. Something, the most important thing in all of human history happens. There's nothing more important than this fact. Suddenly, income and wealth go like that. And I can't get up on my tiptoes to go high enough. That. And what's the date? When does that happen? Like, when is that turning point? 1800s. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like a particular date. There's a particular date I like. Yeah, 1776. That's a great date for when that happens. I mean, no date is accurate, but, but that's a good date. Three important things happened in 1776. You obviously know one of them. But one of them is the first commercialization of the steam engine in England, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We're commercializing power to fuel the Industrial Revolution. Second thing happens. A famous book is published, the most important book of its time, on the value of free trade. Somebody, somebody in the White House should go back and find this book and read it. <laughs> Called The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Why mercantilism is bad and free trade is, in, is, is the only system that enhances human well-being. And the third thing, of course, we declare to the world that individuals have inalienable rights and we are free as individuals to pursue a life, liberty, and happiness. And the world takes off in terms of wealth. And it's true, some of the world doesn't. And it takes it a long time to catch up. And some of the world stays flat at about $2 or less a day. But at what percentage of the world today, the world we live in right now, lives on $2 or less a day? Somebody said 40. That is a, that is a common, common answer. Anybody else want to suggest another number? 70. $2 a day or less? 70. Anybody else? 5%. Okay. 5% is the closest number. It's actually 8. So you're a little bit more optimistic. Only 8% of the world lives today on $2 a day or less. Why? I mean, the 70%, the 40%, that's what everybody thinks. Because the biggest story, 
the biggest story that should have been covered by the media, that should be celebrated in the streets in all over the world is the fact that over the last 30 years, close to 2 billion people have come out of extreme poverty all over the world. Why? Because of foreign aid? Because of welfare programs? No. Because of what? Because countries have adopted a little bit of capitalism. Not even the full-fledged capitalism that I would like to see, that some of you would like to see, but just a little bit of it, and bam, they are no longer poor. 8% of the world, which is too much. And, it, and if, if more countries adopt capitalism, guess what? That number's going to drop to zero very quickly. Very quickly. Africa is on the road to eradicating extreme poverty because some of the countries in Africa are adopting private property, the rule of law, and the idea of individualism to some extent. And they're getting the same result we got in 1776. So, yes, the graph stayed flat for all those countries. But it started going like this in Asia. Anybody know the date? When did it start going like this in Asia? Yeah, 1980 is a good date. It's probably a little earlier. It starts 1978, Mao Zedong. Thank God it dies. Um, and yeah, bad, evil bastard. They should die. Um, and uh, Deng Xiaoping, who's much more of a pragmatist, starts implementing kind of free market policies. In India, it happens a little later, in 1991, as they adopt free market policies. But it doesn't matter. Every one of them has the same result. As soon as they adopt free market policies, wham! Wealth, prosperity, human well-being increase. And yet, the intellectual battle for capitalism, we're losing, particularly here. It's easier today to talk about capitalism in Asia, it's easier to talk about capitalism in Latin America than it is in America today. The birthplace of capitalism, the birthplace of the ideas that were institutionalized into politics that made capitalism possible. Ideas that came from the Enlightenment, came from Europe, came from John Locke and the Enlightenment thinkers of the 18th century. And we have to ask, our question, ask, ask ourselves, why? Why is it so difficult? to make the argument for freedom, for individual rights, for capitalism, when we've been so successful, so successful. I mean, think how rich we are today. We take it for granted. Our kids certainly take it for granted. As long as the next iPhone comes out, they're happy. Where it comes from, nobody knows. By the way, anybody know where iPhones are made? They're so big part of our life. Where are iPhones made? No, they're not made in China. Anybody know where they're made? They're actually assembled in China, but that's just assembling. That's easy. Where are they made? I think the number I saw was something like 58 different countries. You want to block international trade? 58 different countries make stuff that goes into the iPhone. You know, there's stuff from Taiwan, and there's stuff from Korea, and there's actually raw materials from Africa, and it, and it all comes to China, and they put it together, but where's the idea for the iPhone made? Here. Here. Right? So we, we're producing, the whole idea that America doesn't produce anything is, you know, I don't have a nice word for this, nonsense. You know how much actual industrial production happens in the United States? Everybody's talking about with the end of, you know, the end of manufacturing in the United States. Do we make more, ma do we produce more manufactured good in the United States today than we did in 1979 or less? Double, more than double. We've never manufactured more stuff in America than we do right now today in the United States. But we do it with less than half the people. Why? Because we're much more productive. Why are we more productive? Because we have robots and we have computers and we have beautiful things. How many people worked in agriculture 100 years ago? Like, I mean, 200 years ago, it was 90-something percent of the population. 100 years ago, maybe it was 50 percent of the population. How many people work in agriculture today? Less than 1 percent. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a great thing. It's wonderful. And by the way, do we produce more food or less food? More food. Should we celebrate more food, even though it means less jobs? Yeah, because all of those people are working. 
Not in the old jobs, those hovable jobs, those backbreaking jobs, those nasty jobs. Now they've got much better paying jobs, much better jobs. So what are we complaining about? Why is manufacturing jobs a measure of anything? Again, that's not capitalism. Talk about manufacturing jobs. The jobs at Apple are not manufacturing jobs, even though the end result is manufacturing. What are the jobs at Apple? Ideas jobs. We're good at ideas. We, thanks to yeah, relatively loose immigration laws in the past, we have brought to this country some of the smartest people from the world, and they brought ideas. 50% of startups in Silicon Valley that go up to be successful are started by immigrants. I know it's uncomfortable to talk about it, but it's fact. We're supposed to be the ones for free speech. Right? Talk about anything. We, up, we are the people of ideas. We created the ideas of 1776 that liberated the world from poverty. No country, no system in human history has done more to eradicate poverty than capitalism. Indeed, I would flip that around and say the only system in human history to eliminate poverty, even a little bit, is capitalism. But we're not willing to defend it. Our kids are enamored with socialism. What's a good example right now of socialism? Venezuela. Yeah, Venezuela is a great example. Great example. What's happening in Venezuela? They were a little poor. They're going down towards that $2 a day. They, can't ha they don't have food. I know people who are from Venezuela and who visit Caracas, and they tell me that there are no pets in Caracas because they've eaten them. We know that they've broken into the zoos and eaten the zoo animals. Middle class kids are dumpster diving you know, to collect food in dumpsters because there's no food. Why is there no food? Why is there no food? Why are farmers, Venezuela is on the richest soil in all of Latin America. 30 years ago, Venezuela was the richest country, richest country in all of Latin America. They have more oil reserves in Venezuela than in Saudi Arabia. So why is Venezuela so poor? They should be rich. They nationalize the farms. Guess what happens when you nationalize farms? Guess what happens when you make farming collective? Nobody produces food. Guess what happens when you nationalize oil industry? You can't keep up with technology and you can't get the oil. The oil in Venezuela is hard to, how to get. It's in the ocean. Whereas the oil in Saudi Arabia is easy to get. It's on the surface. That's why the Saudis can do it. But the Venezuelans can't. can't. The Saudis are also smart. They allow lots of foreign investment in. The Venezuelans don't because they're committed socialists. And they don't want those capitalists benefiting from their oil. So Venezuela is poor because of socialism, nothing else. And they say, no, no, they just had a bad leader. How come every single country in history that's socialist has a bad leader? <laughs> How come the, so the, the Stalins always show up in socialist countries and, and the capitalist countries get the good leaders? I mean, really? Is that the problem? Maybe there's something wrong with the system that encourages bad leaders to loot and to steal and to take everything away from people. The system is corrupt, and therefore corrupt leaders are attracted to it. It's not that corrupt leaders corrupt the system. It's the other way around. And yet, what do people tell us about socialism? What do you say when you tell people, well, look at Venezuela, what do they say if they stick around to talk to you? It wasn't real socialism. Next time, next time we'll get it right. And when you say, and when you give them another example, I see the cards, uh, we're getting lots of cards. I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. When you give them the next example, oh, that wasn't right. Stalin wasn't good, and Lenin wasn't good, and China wasn't good, and Mao wasn't good, and this wasn't good, and that wasn't good. They've always got an excuse. And they won't face the fact that socialism is evil. It's an evil ideology. So here we've got one political, social, economic system, and I consider capitalism much more than economics. It's social, it's political, it's about freedom. That's been an incredible success story. And you've got one economic system, political system, that's been a disaster. And yet, what does everybody want? They want the disaster. Now, until we understand why that is, 
Until we figure out what is actually going on, we will continue to lose. Because there's something we are doing that's wrong. There's something we are messing up because the knowledge is out there. It's not like anybody thinks Venezuela is rich. You can't say they're ignorant. They know Venezuela is poor. They know they used to be rich. But they're not attributing to socialism. Why? They know we were poor and now we're rich, and they're not attributing that to capitalism. Why? So I don't think the problem is ignorant, although, granted, people are really ignorant. <laughs> really ignorant. Particularly if they've come out of the public school system. They're unbelievably ignorant. Particularly of history. Particularly of economics. They have no clue. And, you know, some of you are a little ignorant too, 70%. We're going to have to talk afterwards. Um, <laughs> so granted, there's a lot of ignorance out there, but it can't just be ignorance. I mean, anybody here been to Hong Kong? I think I've said this at Steamboat before, right? You got to go to Hong Kong at least once in life. You got to see it. It's magnificent. It is beautiful. Skyscrapers, more skyscrapers than New York City on a smaller footprint. Seven and a half million people living on this small little place. And they're producing, and they're creating, and they're building, and there's energy, and everybody's moving. Everybody's moving. And 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago, Hong Kong was a little fishing village. There was nothing there. And today, the GDP per capita is higher than the United States of America. What it took us to produce 250 years, it's taken them less than 100, and they've done it. They're richer than we are. It's pretty amazing. Why? Why? How did Hong Kong do it? Capitalism, freedom, no safety net. There is one a little bit now, but there never used to be. People used to swim there. They used to get on little boats from Asia and row there. They used to do everything. They used to struggle, risk their lives to get to Hong Kong. And they were dirt poor when they arrived there. They just like all our ancestors were dirt poor when they arrived here. And they worked, and they struggled, and they built, and they created, and they made, and they're rich now, just like we are, because of the hard work of our ancestors and our own hard work, because we were free to do so, and because in Hong Kong they're free to do so, they're rich. So why doesn't everybody look at Hong Kong and say, we want that? Instead, they look at Venezuela and they go, we don't really want that, but we want that. It's weird, right? Do people really want poverty and misery? And, and, and most people don't. I mean, some, a few intellectuals do, granted. There's some professors at universities who do, and they say so. They don't like human beings. They don't want us to be around. Um, but most people don't want that. They want to be successful. They want their kids to be successful. So why aren't we all capitalists? It works. So I don't have a lot of time to give you the answer to the why, but I want, I'm going to give you some hints. I want you to think about it because it's the most important question I think we face. Again, I don't care who's in the White House I, I, anymore that much because it doesn't matter. Congress just passed a, uh, a spending bill that's bigger than anything Obama did. They're spending more money than the Obama administration did. Republican House, Republican Senate, a Republican President, and we can't keep spending under control. Yeah, we cut taxes. It doesn't matter. I'm an economist. It doesn't matter if you cut taxes, if you keep on spending like there's no tomorrow. It does not matter. You want to reform health care? Well, what Dan Mitchell didn't tell you is that 90% of those health care costs are Medicare. And you got to dramatically reform Medicare. I'd like to see phased out. I don't like Medicare. I think it's a real, it, you know, socialist medicine. Anybody here for social, socialized medicine? Anybody? Good. Is there anybody here for Medicare? Because Medicare is just socialized medicine for anybody over 65. So why is it good for people over 65 and not good for people under 65? If we hate socialized medicine, we have to hate Medicare. And I know some of you receive Medicare, so, you know, I'm sensitive to that fact. But again, you, you, it's, you, you come out as a hypocrite. We all come out as a hypocrite. And this is part of the problem of us advocating for capitalism. If we advocate for free market health care, but force Medicare, then we are contradicting ourselves and we're hypocrites. You have to be consistent. That's one of the lessons we have to learn in defending capitalism. We have to be consistent. So 
as long as government spending is going like this, as long as, you know, regulations are better. But I haven't seen Congress pass one bill that significantly deregulates an industry. I've seen it the regulatory agencies, they are tinkering with stuff and lower regulations. And as soon as the Democrats come back to the White House, they'll increase the regulations and we'll play this ping pong, right? But if Congress actually passed a bill getting rid of regulations, that's hard to overturn. That's hard to undo. We have the House, or you have the House, the Senate, and the White House, and they haven't done it. They haven't even proposed it. Never mind done it. This isn't Ronald Reagan. This isn't the 80s when real deregulation happened at the, at the legislative level, not just at the administrative level. So I'm, I'm kind of giving up on politics, because this is education at the end of the day. What do we do? Why does nobody buy it? And I think the, the, the fundamental thing is this idea on which America was founded, which nobody really wants to talk about. And it's the idea of individualism. America was founded on the idea of the sanctity of the individual. Not of the group, not of the collective, and not of the nation. The idea of the sanctity of your life. You are the measure of all things. The government's job is to protect you as an individual. And yet we live in a world of tribes and collectives and groups, and the individual has been lost. It's all about which group and which tribe and, 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 and which collective you happen to belong to. And again, the left has been very good at this game. Identity politics is their, you know, is their currency and what they pitch to us all the time. But the right is catching up in this collectivistic, tribalistic game. That's anti-American. It goes against everything that the founders believed in. It's not what this country is really founded on, and it's not, cannot be the basis on which we build a capitalist society. Capitalism is about individualism, individuals pursuing their happiness, individuals pursuing their lives, individuals making the most of the one life we have on this planet. It's not about the group, however you want to define that group. And if you believe in groups, if you believe fundamentally, morally, that the essential purpose of the individual is to live for the group, to sacrifice for the group, to benefit the group, then they've left as one. They've won the battle. Because what is socialism about? What's the essential characteristic of socialism? What's that? In what, but why does it manifest itself? How does this collectivism manifest itself? What do socialists want? They want to sacrifice individuals to the group. And the more individuals they can sacrifice to the group, the more worthy they are, the more moral they are, the more virtuous they are. You know, if you have to kill, what did, uh, what did Lenin, I think, say, or Stalin? You know, you have to break a few eggs to, bake, to, to make an omelet. Well, a few eggs is 40 million people in the case of Stalin. In the case of Mao Zedong, it's 60 million people, but nobody cares. Right? You walk into a room, you walk into a room and you say, I'm a Nazi. Everybody goes, oh my God, get out of here. We don't want to have anything to do with you. And justifiably so, Nazis are subhuman. Anybody who identifies himself as, as associated with that ideology doesn't deserve respect, doesn't deserve to be, I mean, they, 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 they're going to be heard because we have a First Amendment, but you don't have to stay around and listen. If somebody walks into a room and says, I'm a communist, oh, really? That's kind of interesting, quaint. Not so quaint these days, I guess. There are too many of them. Nobody shudders with fear. Nobody resents what it is. Why? Because supposedly, socialism is moral. It's ethical. It's virtuous. It's about helping the poor. It's about helping the group. And we have to sacrifice a few individuals on the side. So what? They were rich or privileged or whatever term you want to use at the time. If we don't value the individual, qua individual, if we're willing to sacrifice the individual for the sake of the group, then socialism is right around the corner. That moral question about whether individuals should be sacrificed or not is the key question. That doesn't mean you don't fight for your values. It doesn't mean soldiers don't fight for their values. It means they fight for the right values, the values that are important to them as individuals. They don't want to live in a world without freedom. But if we start saying, oh, we can sacrifice this industry to that industry, or this group to that group, 
Or we're going to favor these interests instead of those interests. Right now, farmers, poor farmers, tariffs are really hurting them. So we'll give them 20 billion. Make them happy. I mean, what? Wait, wait, wait. That's my money. It's your money. Did I, did I agree to that? I thought it was my money. Property rights, you remember those? So this question of collectivism versus individualism, which crosses party lines, is the key fundamental question that we have to debate, discuss. What is the unit that's important? Is it America? Like, I would like to see a presidential campaign run on the slogan, I want to make individuals great again. <laughs> or how about, how about as president, I'll defend the rights of individuals like our founders did. I, you know, I love America. I came to this country. I'm an immigrant. I, I, you know, I know America. I, I'd fight for America. I fought for my country. I kind of was forced to, but, you know, I did that. <laughs> but I would fight for America. I love this country. This is the greatest country in human history. Why? Because it's the only country in human history built, created on a moral premise that your life is yours to live as you see fit. And then me, as a politician, have no right to it have no right to your time. I have no right to anything about you. My job is simple as a politician. Protect you. That's it. Military, police force, judiciary. Other than that, nothing else is my business. Thomas Jefferson said, if my neighbor doesn't have his hand in my pocket, he can do whatever the hell he wants. He didn't say hell, but whatever the hell he wants in his home. That's, that's what we, if we do believe in capitalism, need to defend. The right of the individual to live as he sees fit. And until we're willing to really defend that, until we're willing to put aside the collectivism, the tribalism, the nationalism in the negative sense, not in the patriotic sense, then we cannot win because the left has, they're more consistent. You want sacrifice? They know how to do it. You want nationalism? They know how to do it. You want any of these things? They know how to do it. Is that time? Yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. So what we need, last sentence, promise. <coughs> what we need is to resurrect what's truly American. It's to go back to our foundations, to go back to our roots. My favorite document in all of human history is the Declaration of Independence. What we need, what we need is to resurrect those words that each one of us has an inalienable right that no democracy, no group, no collective can take away from us. We have an inalienable right to our own life, our own liberty, and in the most individualistic thing ever that any political entity ever uttered, we have a right to pursue our own happiness. When we get that right, we will win. Thank you. What's that? You have better questions than all the other speakers combined. All right, we have good questions. Where is John Galt? <laughs> is it, uh, he's not here. Is it better for capitalism to go, some, for capitalists to go somewhere else and start over or stay here and fight for freedom? Um, so I've always, I'd always say that, that it's better to stay here and fight for freedom. And I still think that, but less so than I used to, I guess. Because I think that there's something about America, because of where it comes from, because of its founding documents, because of its heritage, that there's still that spark of personal responsibility, of taking your life seriously, of that individualism that just doesn't exist in other places around the world. But I have to say that over the last few years, as I travel around the world speaking, I'm seeing more and more of that on the rise in other countries and more and more of that in decline in America. And that saddens me to no end. I'm seeing, particularly in places like Eastern Europe, Latin America, some places in Asia, where people are discovering the power of freedom and they want more. They don't want less. They've done socialism. It didn't work. They've done fascism. It didn't work. It seems like we have not learned from other people's experience. We want to do it ourselves. So it, it's hard to tell these days. Where, now, again, starting over is tough because uh, where do you go? 
I mean, it, it, we're still one of the fierce countries. Though, you know, in the Economic Freedom Index, the United States is now 15 to 19, depending on the, on the thing. I mean, countries like, like those wonderful socialist countries, supposedly, socialist, like Sweden and Denmark are, are above us in economic freedom. You know, Canada is more economically free, according to these indexes, than America. I mean, what a travesty is that? And it's not because they became freer. It's because we became less free. Why be, oh wait, I'm not sure what that says. Conservative and libertarian, uh, oh, conservatives and libertarians often scoff at Ayn Rand when she has more influence than all of them combined. I didn't say that. Why do Beltway conservatives, why do Beltway conservatives? Um, I mean, Ayn Rand's controversial, right? I mean, and, and this is why people scoff at her. Yes, she's had more influence than, than almost anybody in the 20th century in, 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 in many parts of the world. Um, the positive influence, there's been plenty, plenty of people providing negative influence, uh, but they very, very few. Who and Milton Friedman basically resurrected the term capitalism. Capitalism was a dirty word in the 50s. Nobody talked about capitalism in the 50s. And Milton Friedman and I ran, resurrected that word and created it. I don't know that Ronald Reagan would have been elected in 1980 if not for Ayn Rand, even though she refused to vote for him. Uh, for a variety of reasons. But Ayn Rand, uh, conservatives don't like her, and, and there's good reason for you guys not to like Ayn Rand, right? She was an atheist. You heard what our previous speaker said about atheists, um, me included, I guess. Uh, she's an atheist. She was uh, on social issues. You, many of you would be opposed to her views. She really believed in capitalism all the way. No, no compromise. Conservatives often compromise on capitalism. They don't want purely free markets. There's often a compromise. She believed in individualism all the way. She proposed a moral system based on individualism that placed your well-being as an individual long-term, rationally determined as the primary moral focus of your life. So yeah, she overturned much of the philosophical foundation that we've been living with for 2,000 years. So yeah, it's going to take a while until people start taking us more seriously than they have been. But it, it's coming. It is coming. Um, what's your best explanation of why capitalism emerged and where, did, and where it did? Is it Protestantism? No, it's not Protestantism. Capitalism emerged where it did in the, really in the 18th century into the 19th century because of the Enlightenment. Um, now, I'm going to be controversial, so you, know, you knew what you were getting. Um, I don't believe capitalism and the founding of America are based on the Judeo-Christian tradition. I do not. I believe that indeed they are based on the, 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 the partial rejection of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is the thinkers of the Enlightenment. It is the thinkers of the Enlightenment that are basically saying religion, keep that at home. But here are the principles by which we build countries. This is the principles by which we build societies. These are the principles by which you should, for the most part, live your life. And what's another age for the age of Enlightenment from which, from which America is the pinnacle, the, the, the massive achievement. What's the age for that era? It's not the age of faith. It's the age of reason. It's the age of reason. It's the elevation of reason during the 18th century that made America possible. When Tom, if you look at Thomas Jefferson's memorial, what it says on the top, and I'm paraphrasing because I, I should know this by heart, it says, before everything bring, uh, uh, before reason bring everything, even the existence of God. Reason is the pinnacle. Reason is everything. Reason is the way in which we know about the world. It's a scientific revolution and the enlightenment, the age of reason revolution that happens in the 18th century that made this country possible. There is no right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. There is no freedom of speech in the Old Testament. I know the Old Testament, you know, given my background from Israel, not the new one. But there's no free speech in the Old Testament. Now, you, you disagree? You're done. <laughs> ask Moses. Ask someone. And Moses comes down from, the, from Mount Sinai. He's got the Ten Commandments and some Jews are worshiping a golden calf. He doesn't go up to them and says, hey, freedom of religion. Do you do your thing? We'll do our thing. We're going to part ways here by. No, he picks up a sword and kills. I think it was 30,000 people that day and gets rewarded for it. That's the Old Testament. Right? So no, the idea of freedom of thought comes from the idea of reason. If every one of you is capable of reason, if every human being on the planet is capable of using their mind, 
then if we can do that, if we can understand the laws of physics, if we understand, as it is Newton has shown us, if we understand all this scientific stuff about what's going on in the world, then surely we should be able to choose our own profession. Surely we should be able to choose who we marry. Surely we should be able to choose who leads us politically. So if we have reason, if we discover, as the Greeks did in Enlightenment, that reason is what makes us human, then we want freedom to allow that reason to flourish, to manifest itself in the world. And that leads to political freedom because, again, if you have the capacity to think for yourself, you want to choose your political leaders. That's where democracy comes in. I mean, I'm not a big fan of d big D democracy, but the, the elections. There are no elections before that. There are a few republics here and there. They all fail. But only when we discover this do we get freedom, the freedom of the individual, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, all those wonderful rights in the Bill of Rights are products of the thinkers of the Enlightenment. Who is the most cited thinker in the Federalist Papers, most important documents leading up to the, to the, to the, to the really creation of this country? Who's the, most, who's the most cited thinker? Anybody know? Yeah, you think John Locke. That's what I would have thought when I, when I first was asked this question. But no, it's Montesquieu from the French Enlightenment, which was super secular. A super secular enlightenment. They cite Montesquieu, they cite Voltaire, they cite Locke, they cite Hume, they cite, you know, they, they cite the thinkers. That's what they're talking about. They're not citing passages from the Bible. They're not. It's not what the founders were doing. They were engaged in intellectual pursuit of figuring out what was true, not what was written in a book. Now, maybe the, same, the, the, the two are the same. Some of you would argue. Fine. But their focus was on reality to discover truth. That's what they were focused on. So it came about because of those great thinkers, and it's all a, if you look at history, it's all a, I think we're, a, we're a, 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 a Greek, we're very much a Greek culture. If you think about the ideas of Greece are rediscovered in the Renaissance, that's why it's called the Renaissance, you know? Renaissance of what? Of Greek culture. They discover the statues and the thinkers and Aristotle and Plato. And the Renaissance leads directly to the Enlightenment, and that's where we are. We are very much children of Aristotle. We are children of Greek philosophers. What should our national policy on I have no, immigration be? Okay, what should our national policy on immigration be? All right, you asked the easy ones, huh? I say I, I would make it very simple. So we have a welfare state today. I mean, generally, if we had a laissez-faire capitalist in America, if, if it was really capitalist in America today, if we were truly had a free market, if there was no welfare state, if there was no redistribution of wealth, if, if there was real freedom in America, then the only immigration policy consistent with American principle is that the founding is the immigration principles of the 19th century. You're welcome. We do a background check. You're not a terrorist. You don't belong to some Islamist group. Uh, you don't have a, you're not a criminal, and you don't carry an infectious disease. Welcome. Welcome to the land of the free where we are welcoming of anybody who's willing to work for a living. And since there's no welfare state, you either work for a living or starve. That would be my policy under freedom. Now, we're not in a free market. We have a welfare state. I would say I would make it very simple. This is actually, you know, Helen Kriebel. Helen Kriebel, uh, who's, who's uh, from Denver, uh, or was, I think she lives in Connecticut now. I don't know how you do that move, but anyway. Um, Helen proposed what I think is a very rational immigration policy. Her proposal is this. Get rid of all the visas, get rid of the State Department issuing people visas, get rid of all of that, and give the ability to give visas to employment agencies. Have them, employment agencies, open offices all over the world, and give them the ability to run FBI background checks, and give them employment visas. Anybody who can get a job in the United States, please come. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of openings in construction, which we and Americans are not filling. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs picking apples and strawberries. All that farming, by the way, in California is moving to Mexico because the workers can't come here, so we're moving the farms over there. Is that better for us or worse for us? Right? Um, if, you are, if, you, if you have an idea on how to start a business, please come. If you are a high-tech engineer, please come. I, let me say something again. Unpopular. There's no such thing as an American job. There's no such thing as GDP. These are collectivistic aggregation terms. Who cares what the GDP is? What you should care is about your job. You don't have a right to a job, so what should you do if you care about your job? Work hard. 
Learn new skills. Keep making yourself better so that nobody can take your job. Challenge yourself. You know who's going to take your job? It's not going to be an immigrant. I can tell you who's going to take most of your jobs. Now, a lot of you are retired, but most of you are still working. Who's going to take your job? A robot. So you better figure it out, because no matter what your immigration policy is, robots are coming. And we're not going to ban them, I hope. I mean, we could. But I don't think there'll be fewer jobs when their robots are here. There'll be more jobs when their robots come, because they always are. Technology always creates more jobs than it destroys. But, you, but there are going to be different jobs. So be flexible. I hope in business schools, that's what we're teaching. You've got to be flexible. You've got to think about your career over decades, and therefore think about career in terms of change. How do I constantly keep up? How do I change? That's reality. So yeah, bring them in. Bring anybody who's willing to work in this country, bring them here, because you know what? They'll make, they'll produce, they'll build. As I said, half of Silicon Valley successful companies were started by, by uh, uh, immigrants. The CEOs of Microsoft, of Google, one or two others, are, are immigrants. We want those people. But we also want the apple pickers. Because you know what? Americans don't do it. But even if they did, yeah, if the Mexicans can do it a little cheaper and I can spend less on my grocery bill on Apple, good. Why is that a bad thing? That's the American way of doing it. I'm done, I know. <laughs> so look. I, I think this is, how you measure, uh, this is how you measure any political policy, any proposal. Does it increase freedom or does it decrease freedom? That's it. Does it increase a movement towards protecting individual rights or does it violate individual rights? Obamacare violates individual rights. That's easy. Medicare violates individual rights. That's easy. How do we reverse those? those You've got to have plans for all that. But the way to judge a policy, any policy, is does it increase freedom or decrease freedom? I don't know about you guys. I'm for freedom all the way, every time. Thank you all.